Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. This week we've got Lenny Feingold with us, and I'm really excited about this because Lenny has been on my radar for a number of years now. Uh, every time we hear any kind of updates about what's going on in accessibility law, Lenny's name crops up. So really excited to have you here, Lenny. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I really want to talk to you about a bit of background as to how you first off started, uh, what you're doing uh, now with the structured negotiation uh, way of, of, of dealing with cases, etc. So first off, if you could uh, tell us a bit about how you came to, to work in the disability rights arena. Uh, sure, and first let me just say thank all of you and your big audience for including me in Access Chat. I, I love the service. I love what you guys are doing. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, yeah, so I've been doing this work with the blind community for 20 years. And it started, I was working um, at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund in Berkeley. And I got a call from someone who was a lawyer that I knew. And he had gotten a call from his friend, Steve Mendelson. And Steve Mendelson is a blind lawyer in the United States. And it was 1994, and Steve was frustrated because he couldn't use a single ATM, automated teller machine, automated banking machine, as some countries call it. Um, there weren't any that were accessible anywhere in the world. And so Steve asked his friend, and his friend asked me, you know, would you like to see if the new ADA could do something about not having accessible ATMs? And that's really how it started. And uh, there was a great group of advocates that got together and other lawyers, Linda Dardarian, who I still work with today, and her partner, Barry Goldstein, and we sat down and we said, should we sue the banks about this or maybe we should try talking to them? Maybe that would work. And we wrote three letters in 1995 to Bank America and Wells Fargo and Citibank, and we said, you know, there's a problem here where your ATMs aren't accessible to blind people. We could sue you about this, but, you know, rather than do that, would you like to sit down and talk about it? And honestly, much to our surprise and shock, they all said, yes, let's sit down and talk about it. So that was the beginning of structured negotiation, which is a dispute resolution method that we use uh, without filing lawsuits to resolve claims of people with disabilities, blind people. Actually, it's a process that I think could work in a lot of different legal fields, not just disability rights. And cool. That's how it started. Okay, so I'm I'm really interested because as a, a European, we have this view of America as super litigious, um, <laughs> and, and and you know that's why we have all of these things saying caution may contain hot liquids on our cups of coffee and stuff <laughs> like this. And yet, what you've done is runs completely counter to that. And I think it's really it's really interesting that that you took the sort of partnership approach to the problem solving um, and I'm, I'm interested to find out how successful that's been and, and whether or not your your approach is, is unique or, or there are other people within the field that are doing this. Uh, well first I need to say that you know litigation gets a bad rap in the United States and obviously around the world um, but Lawsuits have been really critical in establishing disability rights in the United States um, in all sorts of fields, including the accessibility fields. Um, there's many lawyers who do lawsuits on issues of web accessibility. Those are important lawsuits. There's been a lot accomplished. So um, I see structured negotiations as a tool that's really a successful tool. And every group of clients and lawyers have to sit down at the beginning of their relationship and say, you know, how do we want to approach this? My approach is structured negotiation. Um, it's been really effective. We started, as I said, with the ATMs. And as we were finalizing the agreements with the banks, because we did develop talking ATMs during those negotiations, there weren't any, like I said. Um, and since this is an international Twitter chat, uh, people should know that the first talking ATMs were built by a Canadian uh, firm called T-Base um, and Charlie Ayote, who was the founder of that, and her partner, and they actually one-off built first talking ATMs for Royal Bank of Canada in 1999 um, based on advocate advocacy in that country, and they came down and built the first one in the United States, and that helped us convince the big banks that they need to build it too. 
And so as we were wrapping that up in the late 90s, um, all of a sudden online banking was becoming something of importance uh, to people. When we first started with ATMs, no one was using online banking. Um, and so Bank of America was the first bank in the country to agree that they would make their online banking platform accessible to people with disabilities. They use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 1.0, like within six months after it was adopted by the Web Accessibility Initiative. So structure negotiations since then has been very successful method for getting big companies to realize the importance of digital accessibility and Lawsuits have done the same in different arenas, but I, I like doing things this way. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you kind of answered my my next question, which was around case law. We'll maybe come back to it, but obviously, if you have a structured negotiation, you don't have the associated case law and precedent with it. And I don't know quite how the U.S. law works. Whether case law is so important as it is in 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 Europe and particularly in the U.K. Um, but you said, you know, there's still plenty of other people going out there and there is a case for for, for lawsuits. And, and, and I, I have noticed that Deborah and, and, and Antonio have got questions, so I won't hold the line like too long. Um, so I, I don't, I, do you want to address that before I ask my question, Lainey, or were you just making... Well, just, yeah, just real quick on precedent. Um, precedent is important case law precedent and that's how the American judicial system works. Most cases do settle. And even if you file the lawsuit and you settle it, that settlement is not the same kind of pre precedent as if a judge said something. So I am very glad it helps my work that there's another tool that lawyers use, which are lawsuits, to get precedent. But I think in uh, accessibility, one of the things we talk about is industry precedent and that it's important for companies to see that other companies in their sector are doing this work. So in financial services, for example, we've done a lot of agreements with banks on the importance of accessibility of banking websites, and that is one of the reasons why financial sector sites tend to be more accessible because they can see each other doing it. So it's not the same as judicial precedent, judicial precedent you know, precedent from judges in courts is very important, but there's also the, I don't know, comfort level that companies get when they say, oh, uh, this pharmacy is doing talking prescription labels, we should do talking prescription labels. So that's another factor. And I think that's a really critical factor, the economic, you know, the differentiator and all of that. So, you know, one thing that I'm seeing a lot, Lainey and I, I'm not a lawyer, and so I, um, I, I, I think I see how it's unfolding, but I would be curious from your perspective if you agree. I do know that the lawsuits or the filings of the lawsuits are way up in the United States. We're seeing um, there's, you know, there's uh, rumors of about 20 to 25 every week new ones. I know that I have lawyers contacting me all the time asking me to be an expert witness, which by the way, I, have ne I just have never done it. So my experience is watching television, which I have a feeling is I'm not there. But uh, sometimes I'm troubled by this, even though we've accomplished a lot. That's just the way we do things in my beloved country, the United States. But I wonder sometimes if uh, the thing that I really like about what you're doing with the structured settlement is in the end, we all win because people with disabilities get full access, which is something that's very, very important to me and my colleagues here as well. But sometimes it appears that some of the lawyers that are stepping into this, this is all about the money and that at the end, the, um, the, the corporation or the organization just pays the fine or pays the penalty, and, but no access happens. And so I don't know if that's true. And I'm curious if, you know, if you can enlighten me on that. Uh, well, um, you know, in every field, there are people who do things differently. And we are very lucky in the digital accessibility field that the lawyers who practice in that area have, um, 
I don't know what the word to use is, but um, they may have different approaches and tools like structured negotiations. Lawsuits have been very important in achieving access. The U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education have done really important work in the United States getting uh, private institutions, public institutions, higher ed institutions to do accessibility in a deep way. So when we talk about doing accessibility, both in my structured negotiation agreements that I do with Linda Dardarian, and the NFB does a lot of lawsuits. Linda and I represent uh, the American Council of the Blind in a lot of negotiations. Um, and the Department of Justice and the Department of Ed, we're going deep into accessibility. So it's not just make your website accessible goodbye, but it's do you have a web accessibility coordinator? Do you have a time frame? Do you have a testing mechanism? Because what's really important, whether companies are using lawyers or not, or whatever their motivation, is to really bake in accessibility at a deep level. It's not, you can't just pay, you know, $10,000, get rid of a lawyer, and then you're done. You have to really bake it in. So, you know, if there are lawyers doing it in a different way, that's too bad. I think it hurts us all, but it's not something I, I pay much attention to. I don't count them. I, I, you know, kind of a nose to the grindstone kind of person, you know, I, I, uh, I do the work in this way and, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of lawyers doing it, do it in a respectful, respectful way. We're glad you're here to lead the charge, Lainey. Set the bar high well, for everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't I don't want to say leading the charge. I mean, one of the reasons I'm associated with what goes on in the United States is because I do feel a responsibility to communicate from the legal space to the broader disability community who aren't lawyers, to the accessibility space, to the developers, because everybody needs to know what's going on you know, sometimes I think people think I'm doing all the things I'm reporting on. I just want to say I'm not. <laughs> but I do think it's important for people to know about the law because it is a motivator. And if some people might be misusing it, that isn't so much what matters. What matters is that people do have a right to use laws. And what I don't like about lawyers who might be misusing how they do the cases is it makes people feel, oh, the law isn't good or, you know, every person who wants to enforce their rights is out for some wrong reason. And that's not true. I mean, we have civil rights laws in the country. We're very, very lucky that we have enforcement tools to make them work. Antonio? Yeah. Uh, uh, your career started by you now with, 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 that, with that question on how you could help to, to implement accessible ATMs. Uh, the ATM system was one of the biggest changes in the 20th century in the way how the bank relates with their consumers and customers. Today, we are facing another challenge around mobile and mobility. So do you think that they have learned what they have learned from the ATMs that they can implement today in the way how people use uh, banks on their mobiles? Well, I want to say I hope so. Um, I am an optimistic person. I believe to do this work, we kind of probably you three are optimistic too. Otherwise, you could get kind of depressed at how much is left to do. Um, I do think some companies have learned better than others. I think that um, there's so many people doing the work from so many different directions. I mean, I'm doing it from the legal space, but uh, I think the state of app accessibility is better with large institutions, but take Australia right now. They have a big problem with the point of sale systems that the bank actually named Albert that is not accessible and advocates in Australia are really uh, working to get that changed. Uh, the Digital Gap Initiative is really working hard because we have tablets now and chip and pin cards, and there's always going to be something new, which is why it's so important, as I said, to bake in the accessibility, because no one wants to, first of all, keep getting lawsuits or even friendly, gentle letters from me in structured negotiation. Um, accessibility shouldn't be something that comes from the outside, from lawyers pushing it. I often say I would like to be out of this business and not needed. 
Um, but yeah, banking is so crucial and we started with that because financial privacy issues and the importance of keeping your financial information private. Same thing's happening in the healthcare sector. There's health information digital now everywhere, uh, not just mobile apps and websites, but actual devices, medical devices that if people can't have confidential access to the information, it's information about their very own health and their very own body. So disabled people really need that access and healthcare is the next horizon along with finance in terms of private information. Uh, the, the type of people that you deal, that you have to deal with that represent the companies, are we talking about the chief information officers? Well, the way it works in the United States, lawyers are kind of supposed to talk to lawyers. So when we first uh, structured negotiation starts off with an opening letter where we write to the company and we explain what the problem is. That letter goes to the top lawyer at the company. One of the things I like about structured negotiation is we get to the we get outside the legal office faster than if you file a lawsuit. So the chief information officers or the web developers or whoever the company really feels is needed to bring in to get to the solution. But we have to start out with the lawyers, otherwise we'd be committing malpractice. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to do that. I, no, no, definitely not. Uh, I, I'm interested that you mentioned point of sale because this is something that's of, of interest to me. I've been um, looking at different point of sale systems and um, talking with a number of people about the huge amount of trust that uh, you have to place in friends and a shop assistants when you go shopping with a credit card and, and have to put in your details. It's it's quite scary. Um, I know of a colleague of mine that thought he'd entered a 10% tip and it actually was uh, got the digits in the wrong place and could have could have spent a couple of thousand pounds. Uh, because there was no feedback on any of these machines, it's uh, quite quite a big issue. So, what what's going on in in Australia now? That's that, that, is, is there some kind of groundswell? Is it, it organised in terms yes, of um, feedback? Yeah. Well, I don't. Um, yeah, there's a the there's a community grassroots organisation called the Digital Gap Initiative, and they. I think grew out of this campaign about these banking systems, which it's so annoying to me. The bank actually named the device, like I said, to, you know, personalize it. Isn't this a great and friendly device? Well, not if you can't see the screen. It's not great and friendly at all. So um, they're working on that. In the U.S., we did with structured negotiation, with structured negotiation about 10 to 12 agreements with the biggest uh, retailers in the U.S. in the mid 2000s, starting in like 2005 to 2009, first with Walmart, and this was at the time when the point of sale devices in retail were switching over to flat screen, and there were no keypads. You could not even enter your pin. And Walmart was a great negotiating partner, as were a lot of the other big companies. We did a deal with Target, CVS, Best Buy. Um, on the fact that you have to have a tactile way to enter confidential financial information. So like you say, people have to give their PIN number. Um, now with the chip and PIN cards, there's new devices with the tablets for payment. I hope we're not looking at a new round of that. Um, and it's not just input, as you say, it's also feedback. It's an area where we need a stronger set of regulations in the United States for the uh, full accessibility, full range of features. But the law already requires that there be confidential pin entry. And the U.S. Department of Justice has said so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think it's a, it's it's really fascinating that we've got to this stage and we do keep going through these cycles. Um, I think it was Jeff Klein that was was um, showing the, the adoption of technology um, and, and the, the hockey stick of that. And then behind that, you have enterprise technology, somewhat slower, somewhat lower. And then behind that, you've got accessibility in terms of adoption. And yet, 
people with accessibility needs are usually early adopters. So whilst we as people with disabilities may want to um, embrace new technologies early, it's quite often the case that, that in that development cycle, in that new technology adoption cycle, we, we get left behind. So I think working with big businesses is really important. Hopefully they have some kind of collective memory about about this and, and that we can embed it as you say, like you have done through structured negotiations into company culture and process because the products are always changing. Yes. And the other thing is that when you work with large companies like we do, they rely on vendors. And I think one of my happiest moments was I was at CSUN one day and someone raised their hand and said, well, I work for a small company, but we have to do everything accessible because we sell the Bank of America and they insist on it. And that's what we really need. We need it to be a business to business thing where businesses say, if we're going to buy your product or your service, if we're going to put something on our website that you're selling us, it has to be accessible or we're not going to buy it from you. And that's a very big motivator as well. Yeah. Antonio, you're on mute. One of the reasons why I, I was mentioning the CIO is it refers to what we have been talking so far. So we are talking about the, the challenges that they are facing now in Australia. And I'm sure some of those companies that are now facing that already solved some issues before. So in relation with accessibility. So are the organizations learning internally? How they build? No, the, no the, the, I'm sure some of these companies, they may have CIOs over time and you know, a person leaves and another person comes. Are there any type of knowledge being staying in the organization that can, they can say, okay, there's something new coming, new technology. We need to make this accessible. We have a, a track record of building accessible technology. How can this continue as being part of our own brand and our own uh, uh, motives? Yeah, that, that is so important. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I really encourage companies, and it's part of our settlement agreements and also part of Department of Justice agreements and agreements reached by other lawyers, to have an accessibility page on the website that's easily findable, that has a contact information that will go to somebody who understands what accessibility is to make it public, you know, one of the problems with getting lawyers involved is lawyers are risk averse. And so sometimes these companies will talk to their lawyers and their lawyers will be like, oh, don't say anything public. We're not perfect. We'll attract people filing lawsuits. I completely disagree with that approach. I think companies should be out there about what they're doing, about what is left to do, about how they're going to get from what they've done to what they will do. And the more it's public, even if you have turnover internally, like you're saying, it is just just one other factor of getting it to be part of the culture of the company. So that, that's one piece. The accessibility information pages that I'm a big I'm a big believer in. Press releases, we always try to do press releases with our companies. Um, not to say we settled the case, as a matter of fact, we usually don't mention lawyers or even structured negotiation, but just to give the company credit so they can take ownership and feel proud of it. And you know, one of the things I like best is when I see companies take up the banner beyond what they're required to do in in the agreement. Um, like we did a deal with Major League Baseball. They were a wonderful accessibility partner, and they are now real leaders in digital accessibility. They offer their services to other entities who need the skill sets. So there's a real chance for corporate pride in doing it right and not thinking of it as a legal issue and a compliance issue. Deborah, I know you've got another question. Well, again, going back to something you said earlier, Lainey, um, I, I, I just have to tell you I'm fascinated with this conversation. I, um, I've met you a couple of times, but I, um, I'm just really, really enjoying the conversation. Um, I travel a lot to different countries, and I was recently in Turkey with G3ICT, and one thing that, um, that we were doing is um, – focusing on procurement. And so one thing now when we're going into these countries that are, you know, they've, they've signed and ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, one of the first things we're saying to them is make sure that it not only do you have policies and things like that, but you're including it as part of the procurement. 
And I, I thought it was interesting when you were using that example of Bank of America, who has done amazing work. And I remember years ago when I had a technology company, ICT Accessibility, and we were working with some vendors, and they started complaining about IBM. IBM was so bad because they were demanding in their procurements that everything they provided would be 508 compliant. And they, the, the vendor said to me, they can't do that. They're not the government. And I said, well, it's their procurement. They can do whatever they want. You don't have to apply for their bid. You know, you don't have to, you know, try to win it. But if you're going to, make it accessible. So it, I, it's really nice how this stuff is building and building upon each other. And hopefully other countries watching to see, you know, what had been done um, in the U.S., in the U.K., in Australia, and other places. So it, it's pretty exciting and you're playing a very important role. So as a mother with a daughter with a disability, I'm very appreciative of the work that you and others are doing in the field. So. Well, thank you. I should um, say something about the U.S. Department of Justice uh, because they are doing a lot of enforcement actions around the country. And part of the enforcement actions, when they look at a company or a college's uh, digital digital content, they're looking at third-party content, too, and they're saying to colleges and universities where a lot of um, important accessibility work is being done in the United States that you have to look at your third-party contracts, you have to look at your vendors, you have to have a program, you have to do training. So the third party is a big piece. People can't get off the hook by saying, oh, well, I didn't build that, I just bought it from somebody else. Sure. Yeah. And that, that brings me on to two topics which I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, access to learning um, and learning materials. Digital rights management, which is um, tricky at times. And, and, and particularly looking at it from a point of view for people with disabilities who um, are print disabled but aren't blind. Because one of the things that I constantly come across is that when I request an accessible uh, format for a, a book or a topic that would normally be DRM protected, I get a flat text file. That's great if I'm a JAWS user. I'm not. Um, how do we get from where we are now, where most of the most effective disability advocacy, advocacy groups are uh, from the visual impairment and hearing impaired world to one where disability settlements and disability cases and, and advocacy in general takes into account the wider range of needs because I think accessibility has been quite technical and quite narrow and focused upon um, quite well, quite rightly the needs of, of, of people with with um, visual impairments and, 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 and hearing impairments but how do we take that to the next step and get everyone access to, to these learning materials, which are obviously the stepping stone to, to careers and, and, and a better future? Uh, well, that's one of the reasons we use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 AA as a standard, because that is a cross-disability international standard. So even though the press tends to be around the blind people who are benefiting from it, building a site to that standard is a cross-disability standard. And I think Antonio just mentioned the most recent uh, battle in the war about the uh, Google digitizing books, which there was another decision this, this past week. And um, you might want to have Dan Goldstein on from the NFB because he did the work for the disability community in that in that copyright case on the importance of access to digital content. And even though he's working with the NFB, I work with the ACB, we represent blind individuals, the effects impact people with all disabilities. I think you're right, there needs to be more attention paid to that. Same with the talking prescription labels that we're working on. We're doing it with the American Council of the Blind and the nation's pharmacies, but it does benefit people who can't read a label for whatever reason. Yeah, I met him at um, the the French Accessible Web Conference earlier this year, and he was he was talking about some of the work that he was doing. But it would be interesting um, 
to it, to have him on talking about talking about the the, the access to books. Um, particularly the the marriage agreement being ratified is really important, I think. So important, so important. Yeah, I mean, I really like the South African advocates who said that it's a book apartheid. That is a phrase that they used when Western copyright laws basically lock up. You may as well be in a lockbox to not have access to the book. So that is critically important. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. I think we're out of time, aren't we? So we could just, we could talk to you for <laughs> weeks, Lainey, for weeks. So we really, really appreciate your time today. Well, thank yes. you. I appreciate you being on. I appreciate being on. Yeah. Thank you once again. Thank you.